Brother Jordan. So the next question is, we should hide the truth when it's possible others could get offended. All right, Sister Renee, you have an answer for that one? False. <laughs> you can, you can uh, say the truth in love. You don't have to uh, be ugly when you tell someone the truth. Like a lot of people ask hard questions. Um, you know, for instance, Luke, you were talking about how Larry King likes to really set up the people he has on there because he knows that the answer is going to offend people. And sadly, you'll have people like Billy Graham saying, well, there's a wideness. Well, no, why does the road leads to destruction uh jesus himself said uh narrow is the way and he is the way so we have to if somebody says so you mean all those in islam even though they're good people uh no they're not good people because none's good so yeah they are lost sorry i have to tell you that but there's a way to say it uh, i have a heart for catholics i have a heart for jews um and the hatred for jewish people in the christian community growing is really evil to me uh, I don't understand it. Jesus said salvation is of the Jews because he came from Judah. So our savior, when he manifested in the flesh, was born through a tribe of Israel. We should not hate the Jewish people. I don't understand this. Um, we don't hate other lost people. Why would you hate them? I mean, it just, I don't get this. So there's a way to tell the truth in love. You know, when we say and we expose something in the catholic church uh, for instance uh we don't uh, you know offend the people like uh, say evil things about them we we say look these are antichrist doctrines this is another gospel this is work salvation we don't do this with mary this is wrong this is wrong and we show them the scriptures because the foundation of truth is the scriptures and so it's not a matter of opinion uh the truth is jesus jesus said i'm the way the truth and the life and jesus does offend he said i didn't come to bring peace but a sword as a matter of fact he said that all people are going to be offended because of my name so there's no way to not offend people uh i heard someone say one time if you want everybody to like you and for you to never be offensive make sure you stand for nothing you know when you take a stand for anything you're gonna offend people and you really offend people when you take a stand for the exclusivity of salvation through jesus christ so we can say the truth we can be as loving as we can we need to be aware of what if it was you you wouldn't want somebody to preach at you like that there's a way to tell somebody i'm sorry you know you think you're good, you're not. There's a way to say that to them so that they can recognize why they need a savior without telling them what a wicked person they are. You just got to show them God's standards. So there is a way to do it in love. Paul said, without love, we are as clanging symbols. No matter how much prophecy or correct doctrine or how much truth we have, if we, if we don't say it with love, it's just a bunch of noise. So no, we do not hide the truth because it might offend. The truth always offends. All right. Thank you, sister. Okay, Brother Jordan, what's your answer? Yeah, I would say certainly false. I've probably offended three people this week alone. <laughs> it's not, it, it doesn't matter how your delivery is. You can be the most sincere, kind-hearted person. Um, and they're just not going to take well to it. Um slightly, I would say probably about a week before my appearance on uh, Church of the Eternally Secure, I had been working with a cult and um, I talked about how much I love them and, you know, I'm concerned for them and all these things. And when I got on call with them, they said, that, like, it meant a lot to them that they could really feel um, my concern for them. And it was something they appreciated. But then right after that, they continued to uh, three versus one yell at me for an hour and a half. So it doesn't matter how much love you approach a situation with if that person is coming from a spirit of darkness. So we shouldn't be afraid of offending someone. And if we are, and if you're not offending anyone, you're likely offending God. 
So keep that in mind. Okay, thank you, brother. Uh, well, you know, obviously, all of us who are um, outspoken for for Jesus and the gospel, uh, we are going to offend people. However, I, I would like to ask a, a question back to uh, Renee and Jordan and everybody else. Um, give you a hypothetical situation. Let's say that uh, you're you're uh, attending a, a funeral, and uh, you know that the person who died never believed. They either were firmly in some other false religion, or they're an atheist, or they're anti-Christian for something. You know, there's no doubt they never believed. And we know that uh, they're their destiny is is hell lake of fire the second death uh, <clears throat> uh even though we've come to the conclusion that they don't have eternal torment but we know that they will perish they don't have eternal life they don't get to live forever in paradise the new heaven the new earth uh that's the reality of it but what if you're talking to their loved ones at the funeral um is would you would you tell them at a time like that the, the facts, the truth? Or do you think maybe it would be better to not 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 lie or misrepresent or tell them something that just to tell them what they want to hear that, oh, they're, I'm sure they're with the Lord or they're in a better place or whatever, something like that. Uh, um, you're not going to do that, but you just remain silent on that subject well i'm not going to tell them that they're lost they're they're they're, they're going to uh never have eternal life they, you'll never see them again uh, and uh they uh, uh is it better to conceal that truth from them at a time like that knowing that you can always talk to them later maybe a week maybe a year maybe at some point in the future when they're they don't have this uh horrible uh grief they're going through because I believe if you if you tell them the truth at that time, they may end up hardening their heart against Jesus in the Bible, and it never 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 can be uh, rectified. I, I like to hear your thoughts on on that. Yeah, for me, um, I can never cater the message for fear that it's going to harden someone's heart. Because the gospel is the power to intervene and soften someone's heart. Um, I definitely wouldn't come out and say, yeah, they're absolutely burning right now, but I wouldn't, uh, because here's the thing, a lot of people who are grieving, there is such an alarming statistic of the people who are grieving who go out and commit suicide. So will I have time to teach them the real gospel outside of their grieving period? Or is it possible that I can deliver the gospel message, which will save them and the other people who are surrounding it? So I would, I, I at the, we, unless I'm there at the very last second and they're blaspheming God, there's no way that I can absolutely know if they died. Um, I would just lay out what the gospel very clearly says. And I would just say, I don't know what state they died in, but this is the gospel of grace and it is available for everybody. Um, and it's important to say that because you know, even if somebody does harden their heart, that's an active decision to reject the gospel. We're all going to face circumstances in life where it would be very easy to harden our hearts against God. And that's why we are called to humble ourselves, trust in his wisdom, not lean on our own understanding and um, know that he is faithful because everything is to bring him glory and honor. So even if there are things that seem out of our comprehension or even this or even something that seems like it could be hurtful because at the end of the day we're never going to approach a situation where the truth is not going to be hurtful to someone um especially if they're um in a situation where turning from sin means losing loved ones or um removing themselves from a situation where they once had a lot of support or um, 
leaving their creature comforts. So I cannot limit God or the gospel for the sake of someone else's comfort. I would just trust that the Holy Spirit would intervene in me to deliver the words that I need to say. It's not something I would go in without praying about. Oops. Thank you. Uh, Renee, I'm interested in your thoughts on that. You there? I'm sorry, Brother Luke. I had to step away for a sec. Okay. Uh, did you hear my uh, question? No. No. Oh, well, I don't know. Uh, kind of lengthy to explain it again. Uh, I'm sorry. But the question he basically asked is: if Let me let me explain. It. If if, if I gonna have it be explained again, I want to put my own words here. Uh, so you're you're at a, a attending a funeral, and you you know that the person, uh, the deceased person, uh, was not a believer. They're either uh, an avid atheist or uh, they're uh, really uh, enthusiastic about their false religion, and you know that they never believed, and and then you and you but you're talking to their loved ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, would 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 you uh, tell tell them that uh, well they never believed so they are lost and they don't they're not going to go to heaven and they're they're going to perish and uh, or do you, you think that maybe uh, waiting for a better appropriate time when they're not under such grief that you would say this is not the proper time and place to to be making that point that maybe I, I, I'll, I'll try to take an opportunity late some other time to tell them the gospel. So that would be has, has taken over the place of compassion in the church. People are leaving the church and going to secular places to get compassion and to get help. It's ridiculous. I mean, people at the worst places of suffering and grief are, are just, it's like more important that we be right than to comfort. And I just think we can, follow Jesus's example. We can uh, preach the truth. I, Brother Luke, I would never be at a person. It, like you say, let's say we're, first of all, I can't be certain anybody's lost. I, I, I don't, how can I know that? Did they believe as a child and fell away? I don't know that. I cannot know for sure. So first of all, I would never say, I know for sure he's in hell. No matter how far he gone, I don't know that I'm not God. So I would never make that statement anyway. Secondly, if I was certain they probably didn't believe and I'm going to maybe very slim chance they were safe, why bring it up at all? These people are grieving. It's the most painful time in their life. I would never make their pain worse. That would give nothing but Jesus and the church a bad name. You can't recover from that kind of pain being inflicted on someone. I would never do that. Now, uh, it bothers me when I hear somebody go, oh, he's in heaven now with the angels. And you know he's not, probably. You know, it bothers me when people just, everybody that dies, oh, he's in heaven with the Lord now. You hear it at every funeral, but it's not true, and we all know it. Um, there's not, for me, there's not a lot of people that know me that don't know the gospel. Like, I'm not going to let anybody be in my life and not know the gospel. Um, I have a hard time with this Muslim guy because he won't let me talk. So, uh, but I'm working on that. Um, so, I think it would be better at the funeral not to mention it at all. One, you can't achieve anything with it except damage to the church. You're only going to hurt someone so deeply that, that they themselves that are still alive and could get saved won't get saved because they're so hurt and offended by someone claiming the name of Christ. So I think, uh, Brother Luke, it would be wrong to say anything about where that person is. I really do. If we're like leaning on the side that they're lost, there is nothing their family can do about that. And the people that are alive, I want them saved 
but I do not believe the time of their greatest grief is the place for me to say anything. But at my son's dad's funeral, I asked the pastor, because people are thinking of death, to give the gospel before we left. And so he did. So everybody at the funeral heard the good news about Jesus, how it's a free gift. We can know where we're going. You know, it's sad that we have to come here knowing that he's passed on. But now that we have death on our mind, we really all need to know it's coming for us all. And here's the gift. Here's the good news. Nobody needs to mourn or be scared where you're going because here's the good news. So when we did a funeral, I made sure everybody in that place heard the gospel. But I, I wouldn't I wouldn't hurt anyone. It when you have lost someone, there is a pain that takes you so far away and you feel so alone. It is the worst time you could possibly offend someone and hurt their heart like that. And I don't I don't know if they could ever recover from it. I don't know if they could ever recover from that in order to come to faith themselves. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, sister. I um I, I've um, had the uh, opportunity to speak at a number of funerals. And uh, especially as I've gotten older, the funerals <laughs> I attend are more frequent now. Um, but I would never be willing to speak at a funeral of someone that I believe knew was or knew was lost. Um, but th those people who I have spoken at that I've either led to the Lord myself or I'm, I know that they were professing believers, then uh, what a wonderful opportunity to, to celebrate and, and say that we, we know they are, where they are and this is why and present the gospel to, for the whole audience. But if, if that person was not saved and I, I could not get up there and say, well, I know they're in a better place. I, can't, I cannot say something that's not true. I cannot try to try to just comfort them with those words that I know is not true. So I have to just say, I, I, I'm not able to, to speak at this one. Uh, but there's, um, yeah, the scriptures does tell us that if someone grieving, we don't try to cheer them up, we grieve with them. And uh, so, um, yeah, all right. Any more on that one before we go to another question? Okay, let me see, is there another question in the chat room or do we have to go to one of our prepared questions here? If you do have a question in the chat room, we're trying to give you priority now uh, to uh, move right to your questions. If not, then that's we go to prepared questions. What's that, Ray? Yeah, that's a good idea that we're going to the chat questions. Yeah, I think it's more interactive that way. Yeah, that good. Yeah. Very good. Okay, if uh, if you do have a question, put it in all caps so that we recognize it right away. Not Otherwise, don't answer one, as one. He just asked, "Can a person be saved right before they die?" like at the moment of death. Okay, go ahead, Renee. Why don't you go first? Yeah, the thief on the cross was. He was saved. Uh, before before that, while he was crucified, they were, they were mocking Jesus. And right before the thief's death, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So we know that he acknowledged he was the promised savior, the king, the king of the Jews as promised. So acknowledging that means that he acknowledged who he was meaning and jesus confirmed today you'll be with me in paradise so um yeah he was saved at the moment of his death and i do believe god in his mercy will reveal things to people i even believe it's possible he can reveal it to them if they're in a comatose or in some kind of state like that i just don't ever underestimate god's mercy but I also don't leave it to chance like that. I do. If I'm around, I feel like I'm going to answer for not doing what he told us to do. Uh, and that's preach the gospel. That's that's the number one, um, the great commission that we're all given. So, uh, yeah, my son's grandpa, he he was he was dying and got saved. He was very angry at God because of the things he had seen in Vietnam. You know, why do you let all those young men die like that? And. He was just mad at God his whole life. Didn't want to hear nothing about Jesus because my son's grandma was a very, uh, very uh, strong Christian woman. Uh, and she's the one that clarified the gospel to me 13 years ago. I grew up in it. And then I kind of grew up in the Salvation Army Church and then 
a Baptist church. So it was like Southern Baptist. So it was, wasn't real clear. We knew Jesus died for your sins, but you also had to be a good person. So she actually clarified it for me and he wouldn't hear nothing of it. He did not want to hear anything of it. But as he got closer to his death, pastor came and spent time and preached the gospel to him and he did get saved. Um, so yeah, it, see, it doesn't matter when, because he's not willing any should perish. He, he wants everybody saved. And the deathbed conversion is a, a perfect example of God's grace. And I don't understand why if you get saved and you still have 30 more years to live, why the gospel is changes to people. Because if you ask these lordship people, oh, yes, you can have a death get conversion. Well, he's going to die. He can't do good works. He can't change sin. He can't get sin out of his life. But he gets saved. But if I live 30 years now, I got to do that work. Why does he, I got to do that work? And he didn't have to do that. That's not fair. That's not right. See, it, it messes up the gospel when you don't simply stick to the simplicity in Christ that's given to someone on the deathbed. Simply believe. That's how all of us are saved. And the gospel message doesn't say it doesn't change whether you got saved as a child or you get saved on your deathbed. It's still by God's grace through faith in what Jesus did. And so nobody's going to boast uh, when they get to heaven. So, yeah, uh, it's clear you can be uh, saved right before your death. OK, thank you, sister. Well, um, someone, a couple of people come to my mind. Well, first of all, um, my brother died. Uh, uh, and when he uh, he was very very sick, uh, and over a period of several months he was dying, and I I'd been with I'd witnessed to him throughout the years, and he, he really believed more in a like a new age type of beliefs. Um, but uh, before he died, he, he uh, told me that he did believe the gospel now, and uh, I believe he did, and so I believe he's with the Lord. Uh, and but that wasn't just immediately. He didn't believe just a moment before he died. But my, I remember when my father was dying in the hospital, uh, and he was uh, he also uh, was one of these people that was into the new age religion. And uh, he, he once told me when I was talking to him about Jesus, and he 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 says. You say Jesus is God. I'm just as much God as Jesus. And, and I, I, I was just shocked what he said. I said, he, he said, well, don't you, the Bible says, don't you know that ye two are gods? And so, you know, he's right from the New Age uh, belief system. He was very involved with the Edgar Casey Foundation and all that. So um, I, he and I had a lot of talks and I knew he didn't believe the gospel. But he, I remember when he was in the hospital dying. Uh, over a period of about eight hours, you know, uh, I was witnessing to him and praying with, for him, and he was conscious, and uh, he he couldn't really acknowledge anything, but I uh, I was, you know, telling him the gospel and reading him to him a psalm that he liked, and uh, did he believe? Uh, he there wasn't any way for him to tell me. But I, I, I do think that some people have told us, people we know say that it's very unlikely, not impossible, but very unlikely for people to get saved. Because if they didn't uh, care enough to believe in Jesus uh, all for years before, all, they had their whole life to, uh, then th their, their faith as they're dying is superficial faith. You know, they didn't, they can't really be saved. But uh we know that people can be saved at the last moment. There is a parable that I believe is a, a demonstrates this. And Jesus told the parable about the workers in the vineyard. And he said there was this uh, rich uh, landowner and hired people to work in his vineyard. And he hired some people at the sunup at the beginning of the day and told them he would pay them, uh, you know, one denarius uh, at the end of the day. And, uh, and then a few hours later, some other people came and he hired them. Uh, and then uh, middle of the day, he hired another group of people. And the very end of the day, with only less than an hour left in the day, he hired some people. And then when the day was over, he's paying people. And the people observed that everybody was paid one denarius. And the people that worked all day, they complained that, that uh, 
it's, it's, it's unfair. We worked all day for and got one denarius, and they only worked the very end of the day, and they got uh, the same thing. And of course, Jesus said, "Well, the land order said, well, you, it's, it's up to me. That's, if I want to pay people of that, that then uh, you know, don't be, don't be uh, jealous or I forgot how he said it, but don't begrudge me that. If, if I want to be generous and be uh, immersed and gracious to them, and uh, I think that's a, a picture." of people coming to um, faith at different points in their life. Some people come into the faith early in their life. They work their whole life in ministries and doing good works and stuff. But in the end, they got the same thing as the people who came in at the tail end of their life and maybe did little to no work at all for, for, for their, uh, the cause of Christ. And yet they all got the same thing, which is not a denarius, but is eternal life. Um, not everybody interprets that parable the same way, but I, I think that's a, a legitimate way of uh, teaching that parable. Uh, Brother Jordan, what's your answer to this question? Yeah, well, it's a difficult one for me because it's not something that I've really thought a whole lot about, to be honest. Can you um, restate the question Again, just so I can answer it most accurately. Um, well, let me see. Where did that question come from, anyway? Uh, yeah, uh, I asked. Okay, you asked it, Renee. What was it? A person be saved moments before their death. Like oh, see, yeah, it. okay. I did have thoughts on that. I, I thought we got off on hell, so I was like trying to pull my thoughts together and I was like looking some stuff up. <laughs> yes, absolutely. A person can be saved. And um, actually, the thought that I was going to branch off from Renee um, when she brought up the thief on the cross, it's just that's such a beautiful illustration of the simplicity of the gospel. And a lot of people will argue that it was under a different covenant but we have to remember that Jesus died first. Now, this was before the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did say, you'll be with me today in paradise. And we know that um, Jesus spent three days. I believe Abraham bosom is the popular term for it. Renee probably knows this a little bit better than me. But um, like, so we're not quite sure what entailed, but we know that he did inherit eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is a great place to go to because the thief on the cross did not speak in tongues. The thief on the cross did not unpin himself and go get water baptized. The thief on the cross didn't do half the things that are required for salvation. So it, if you have time to trust, you have time to be saved. Absolutely. All right. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, any more, Renee, on that question before we go to the next one? No, but there's another one in the chat in all caps about. Yeah, I, I, I see that. Uh, why don't you go ahead and read it, Renee? Uh, yeah, it says, can a saved person cause their own death early due to sin, like driving drunk or drug overdose? OK, let's give Brother Jordan the opportunity to go first on this one. Yeah, absolutely. They can. And, you know, that is why. See, here's the thing. Our, our theology takes so many hits because we rely so much on eternal security that we almost forget to talk about the severity of hell. We think that, well, as long as I'm saved from hell, I'm good. Woo. And that's why we get so much heat because we never choose to turn up, uh, talk about sin. And then when we do talk about sin, other free grace believers will come out and call us legalists. Um, it's important to preach the severity of sin because like we talked about it builds layer upon layer it starts off small gets bigger and that's why any sin should be taken serious are we going to be clear of all sin not until we're in our glorified bodies i understand that i am speaking to you guys strictly as disciples i am not taught teaching you how to be saved i am teaching or i am teaching you how to operate as a disciple of Jesus Christ, provide a, um, a good testimony and live in a way where you're growing in grace. It's those two examples are great. Like if you develop an alcohol problem and you get in an accident, first of all, what happens if you don't die, but the other person does big problems. But um, 
and then the drug overdose. And a lot of this comes from a place of shame. And when we don't draw closer to God, and that's why I always tell you guys to rely on conviction, see it as a blessing to draw you closer to God. Do not fear his chastisement. I mean, fear God because we should all revere God. But when we let the enemy come in and create shame, that distances ourselves from God. What do you think is going to happen to that sin when we distance ourselves from God and the power that the great uh, power that grace has in us to overcome that sin? So it's very important that we tackle issues very early on. It's important that we read our Bible so we can identify um, early sin and see examples of where that led people. Um, because it's when we grow in that grace that we see deliverance from these things, and those issues don't become a possibility. Okay, thank you, brother. All right, Sister Renee, what's the answer? Yeah, well, yeah, certainly, certainly. And it's so funny you mentioned that, uh, Jordan. Uh, as you know, a video was released recently calling me a legalist. Of all people, I am condemned for promoting sin because I don't talk about the consequence of sin that often the temple I've done videos warning about it how it's a trap how it brings death to your life in every area sometimes literal death so uh that's really funny to me because when you do talk about it as a grace believer you're condemned as a legalist no we're supposed to look most of the new testament is telling us how we should be living to not do these sinful things because you are people of God. So we can't ignore all of the New Testament because somebody thinks we're being legalists. We have to say the truth. It's sound doctrine. Uh, but the problem is when you talk about a sin in a, for a believer, they immediately, their mind goes back to law. Well, I can't do this and don't do that. And, and then they get into condemnation because now they're self-focused and they're worried. No, we need to grow in grace, and then know who we are in Christ. And whenever the sin temptation comes up, nope, that's not who I am. I don't do that because that's not who I am. And so it's not about, oh, did I sin? Did I do that? We're not all sin conscious, but we're Christ focused. So you got to grow in grace because strangely, it's clear that the strength of sin is the law. And Paul says, sin shall not have dominion over you because you're not under law, you're under grace. So People are very uninformed that accuse grace to be a license to sin because it's not grace that promotes more sin. It's law. It strengthens sin. It says it. And, and the law was given so the transgression might abound. So the sin would get worse and be recognized by man. So we see here in 1 Corinthians, they had were getting drunk and not caring for the poor and inviting them to the Passover dinner, not the Passover dinner, the Lord's Supper. And uh, they were getting drunk and overeating, being gluttons, right? And Paul's like, don't you guys have houses you can eat before you get here, you know, if you're going to do that mess? And you shame us because you don't worry about those that have nothing. So Paul tells them this because they were eating and drinking of the Lord's body and blood unworthily. This is what happened. It says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And we know sleep is a term for death, physical death of the believer. We don't say die because Jesus said, who's sober liveth and believeth him, he shall never die. So sleep, we're just sleeping. We say they're sleeping because uh, that's the way they word it in scripture. Also in James, it says, when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death and yes so sin still brings early death uh john talks about a sin unto death um so i do believe very much so that a saved person can destroy his or her life through sin uh for instance they could commit adultery and then one of the jail's husband kills you. I mean, it, it brings literal death like that to being an alcoholic and destroying your liver and dying of that. 
So there's all kinds of ways sin brings physical early death to us. Absolutely. And it says we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to answer for what we've done in the body, whether it's good or bad. So uh, it's not like Christians uh, just don't care how they live. I, I had somebody send me a literal question that said, if how we live doesn't matter with salvation, who cares? What? Like the only reason you're not doing this wicked stuff is because you're trying to stay out of hell. I mean, that's just, that's bad. Like I, it's a strange attitude people have about grace. If, if you're not being threatened with torment forever, they have no motivation to, to just be a decent person. I mean, it's crazy or to even follow Jesus. We should all follow Jesus. He's our leader. He's a good shepherd. So, uh, you know, uh, Christy put a, a good verse in, in Psalms, you know, he leadeth me on the path of righteousness, but first he restoreth our soul. So, uh, yeah, it is very clear in scripture that it can bring death either indirectly, you know, or even directly or as an act of chastisement in some way, as we see in uh, first Corinthians with the Lord's Supper, it was God chastising them. That's why it said, because of this, that's, he's letting them know you, you were chastised. That's why some of you are sick and weakly. And some of you have even died. It was God, God was chastising you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't know how, how many of us have ever stopped to really think about why God uh, said certain things are sin. And he gave us this th list of do's and don'ts. Uh, let, let me take uh, pleasure sins uh, to illustrate this. Uh, uh, what about food? Uh, food can be very, very tasty and enjoyable, and so much so that we we may will overeat and be gluttonous. And uh, uh, what about sex? Uh, obviously, the the uh, the pleasure of sex and the drive to have sex are just built into us, and 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 it causes people to have this um, uh, pursue having sex and and that pleasure. Um, so, if, if these things are so pleasurable and they're they're built in to, to us as human beings, they're natural. Well, why is God telling us don't do these things? Uh, uh, gluttony is a sin, uh, and, and uh, fornication, um, adultery, sex outside of a marriage between a man and a woman is a sin. Uh, is, is God telling us not to do these things that are so, so much pleasure because he wants to spoil our good time and, and, and like torment us? That he, he gives us this great desire, but says, don't do it. Is he just trying to frustrate us, make us angry? Um, no. Uh, God uh, wants us to have the, this uh, sexual relationship within a marriage. That's the healthy way to do it. But God knows that apart from that, if we have an outside of a marriage, or let's say between two people of the same sex, or uh, all these other types of uh, sex that are that the Bible forbids, it's forbidding it because it's bad for us. It's unhealthy. It, there are, do you know that, uh, that probably every sin, I haven't tried to analyze every sin, but I imagine every sin actually comes with its own constant consequences attached to it. A lot of people think that uh, because uh, Jesus paid for our sins and then we get uh, this for forgiveness and our sins were charged to Jesus and his righteousness is credited to us, that that's, that's really not reasonable. That's, 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 that's a crazy concept. Uh, it's, it doesn't seem right. People have to, uh, have to suffer their own consequences. Well, the truth is that none of us really get away with our sin. Uh, uh, we don't have to go to hell uh, because of our sin. But I don't get away with any sin. When I've done something wrong, uh, the consequences, I, I end up suffering some consequences for it. And uh, that's what you can expect. Uh, if, you, if you commit 
adultery. Uh, don't be surprised when you come home with a sexually transmitted disease. Uh, if, if you're having sex uh, and you're not married, don't be surprised if you have an unplanned, unwanted pregnancy. Uh, if you commit adultery, hey, don't be surprised if you you get found out and, and, and now you have a divorce and a broken family. Um, if you steal, don't be surprised if you get caught and go to jail and get a criminal record. So these are the consequences that uh, we have, even though we don't have to pay for our sins with, with uh, uh, p perishing in the lake of fire, we still have sin does bring its own consequences. Sometimes the consequence is an early death, as was part of the question. Yeah, uh, sickness, early death, uh, alcoholism. Um, the Bible doesn't tell us not to drink alcohol, but it tells us not to be drunks. Because if you're a drunk, uh, it, it causes bad behavior, un, uh, un, uh, uh, horrible consequences out of being a foolish from being a drunk, and also health issues from alcoholism. So, um, yeah, the answer to the question is, yes, yeah, it's true that... Uh, uh, when we sin, that it can cause uh, in, uh, various, I forgot exactly how it was phrased, but it can even cause death. Uh, so you're not going to get away with your sin, even if you are. Uh, uh, your sins were paid for by Jesus. In, in between, in this life, until your death and you get your glorified body, you're still going to have to suffer what, whatever you do. There is a law of, not, I don't want to call it a law, I'm sorry. I used to call it a law. Uh, the principle of reaping and sowing. Normally, when you do good things, you have good health habits, you end up having good health. You you may, you may you have a good plan for you know, living within your means and saving for your future, then you have prosperity. Uh, you, so you reap what you sow, but not always. Look at Job. You know, he, he wasn't at fault, and yet look what he was uh, re reaped. But that was to teach us some lessons. Um, and how many times have you known people, maybe you're one of these people, where you didn't do anything wrong and for some reason you had some horrible thing happen in your life, a loss, a, a sickness, some horrible thing. And, you know, they say that why do good thing, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, we know that no one is actually good in, in the sense the Bible says it, and good means perfect in the Bible. But um, uh, in man's eyes, we, we look at goodness as a relative things. Uh, pe people are, we compare each other, and some people are pretty good, darn good, and other people are not good at all. And so uh, those people who are relatively good, why is it that bad, they, bad things happen in their life? They didn't even cause it, and yet something happened. Um, so it's not really a law, it's a principle of reaping and sowing, but it's not absolute. Sometimes that's what happens. Uh, and and uh, I, th I don't know how that relates to the sin, but um, okay, Renee or Jordan? You yeah, I like to that say that, Luke, because it, yeah, it's not really a law, but it is the principle of it. Because there are people that live very healthily and still get lung cancer. There's are, there are people that uh, just live wicked, and it's like they never get anything bad. They get they're wealthy. They treat people terrible. They never have. But you know what? Ultimately, they will answer for it. We we do know that if they're not chastised on this earth for that kind of behavior, it means they're under the judgment of God. So he's letting them build up a judgment on themselves. So you know, uh, I think it is more of a principle. I'm glad you clarified that. Because I, I'm realizing like the words matter because, uh, you know, it's easy to be misunderstood and we want to be careful not to make uh, extreme statements or absolute statements like this never or this always, you know, the law never and always or this is a law of reaping and sowing. It is a, a principle that we see. Uh, that happens. So I, I think that's uh, an error that the health, wealth, pro prosperity people use this law. They make it a law. And if you sow this, then God is somehow indebted to multiply your money like it's a, a IRA or something. You know, that that's not giving that that's investing. It's not a gift. Give a gift. Sow a seed of 800 and you'll get 
you know, hundredfold. Well, that's that's investment. That's not a gift. You're not you're not giving. Um, so yeah, it's a good point. Okay, thanks, uh, brother Jordan. You want to say more about this? Yeah, and I actually like that um, point that you just made, Renee, because. I mean, look at how Jesus responded in the temple when they turned that into a house of merchants rather than a house of glory. And that's what all these prosperity gospel preachers are teaching. I do think it's important to remember that if you are going through a hard time or a chronic ailment or illness, sometimes that is just a natural cause of living in a fallen world. and. So if there's not something that you can identify that you are being chastised for or you don't feel conviction over a certain sin, just know sometimes your circumstances are a product of just being part of a lost and fallen world. That's a good point. I, uh, I've been, uh, as you know, I keep telling everybody, I, I've been re-studying reconsidering uh, eschatology this last year and uh, uh, something I just heard today was that uh, our, our present uh, state uh, is that uh, it's a state of, of suffering and even 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 if we do everything right it's inevitable that in our lives we will suffer because uh, it's a fallen world and our bodies are a result of it. What goes wrong with our bodies? They do not function perfectly forever. It's, we, our bodies start to fail in various ways. We, and, even, and sometimes even we have temporary problems, like a sickness that we suffer. We suffer. Sometimes we suffer a, an awful lot. And uh, it's inevitable. If you live long enough, you are going to suffer. But that's because uh, we we were born into this world of suffering but there's going to come a time in the resurrection in, in eternity where there's no more suffering there's only joy no more no more uh sickness no more death no more crying no more pain just joy and bliss <laughs> <laughs> 